having seen cardinality, which is just the number of distinct items in a set, now it's time to broaden our horizons to talk about sets in more depth and to talk about how do we start to use some of these same approaches like cave minimum value, but to get at the similarity between two sets. All right, so this is going to require that we talk about set unions and intersections and things like this. So let's start by defining some set uh, vocabulary. Okay, so here's a couple of sets, A and B, sets of integers. I'm using the usual curly brace notation to, to, to show, uh, you know, just enumerate all the items in the set. And the first thing we want to remind ourselves is what's the union? The union is just the set of all items that are in either of the two sets. So A union B is a set of all the items that are in either A or B, or both. So that'll be 1, which is in A, 2, which is in A, 3, which is in both, 4, which is in both, 5, which is in B, 6, which is in B, 7, which is in B. Okay? So that's the union. The intersection is the set of items that are in both sets A and B. So which are the items in both sets A and B? Just 3 and 4. So this will be just 3 and 4. Okay? All right? There's another operator called exclusion, where if we take A, A backslash B, we're trying to get at the items that are in A that are not also in B. All right, so in this example, what would that be? Uh, just one and two, right? One and two are the only two items in A that are not in B. So that's exclusion. And then the last one is the symmetric difference, which is the items that are in the union, but not the intersection. Or another way of saying that is, these are all the items that are in one set, but not the other. They're in one set or the other, but not both. Okay, so in this example, that would be, again, 1 and 2, because those are in A, but not B. Now I have to skip 3 and 4, because those are in the intersection. Those are in both. So now what else do we have? Well, we have 5, 6, and 7, which are only in B. Okay, so that's the symmetric difference. Okay, focusing on the union and the intersection, the union and the intersection are related. So let's just look at a nice uh, Venn diagram here. So let's say I have my, my two sets. Maybe this is A, maybe this is B. And I've just used a little bit of color to highlight the union and the intersection, right? So I'm, I'm saying the union is everything in either, right? So it's sort of like, if you follow my cursor, it's everything in this kind of blue perimeter. That's the union. The intersection is just the stuff that's in both. So it's everything inside this red, um, red shape here. Okay, so let's think about an expression for the size of the union, the cardinality of A union B, in terms of the cardinality of A plus the cardinality of B. So in other words, I'm trying to get at the number of items in the blue perimeter, and I'm saying, what if I just took everything in this circle plus everything in this circle? That's not equal to the union exactly, um, because there might be items in the intersection, and if there are any items in the intersection, they've been double counted. We just counted them twice. So in order to get an accurate number for the number of items in the union, I have to subtract them back off. Right? So I've added the number of items in A, the number of items in B, I just need to subtract back off the number of items in the intersection of A and B. Likewise, it, I mean, if we have this expression here, and we'd like another expression in terms of A union B, A, A intersection B, cardinality of A intersection B, I can just add this to both sides and subtract this from both sides, and I just flip the thing around, right? So now the cardinality of A intersection B is equal to the size of this, right, the number of items in here, plus the number of items in here. And now I've Again, I've counted everything in the union and double counted everything in the intersection. But that just means that if I subtract off the number of things in the union, I now have just a single count of everything that's in the intersection. Right? So these are inverse ideas, but they're related. And this is sometimes called the inclusion-exclusion principle, or just uh, 
maybe a less fancy way of saying it would be a, the double counting principle, right? If you want to get at the union or the intersection, you can start, I, I should say, if you want to get at the size, at the cardinality of the union or the intersection, you can always start by adding the sizes of the two sets and then subtract something off to get rid of everything you didn't want. Okay? So there's a kind of, as long as you have the sizes of, these, of this and this, then you have a way of moving between the size of the union and the size of the intersection. Okay. Now, the reason for this lecture is we're interested in similarity. You know, we want to know how similar are two data sets, right? So ultimately, similarity is about intersections, right? If we have set A and set B and we want to know are they similar, we are asking a question about the intersection, or certainly the intersection is an important part of what we're asking about. All right, so to a first approximation, what we're interested in here is the cardinality of the intersection. Problem is, if I just told you I have data set A and I have data set B and the number of items in their intersection is 400, that doesn't really tell you much about how similar they are uh, uh, intuitively, right? Like, because you need to know what's the size of the intersection relative to how large are the sets themselves, right? So the size of the intersection alone is not enough. We need to know whether the number of things in the intersection is high relative to how large the individual sets are. If I told you I have two documents and they have 10 words in common, but the documents are each 1 million words long, you would say, well, that's not very similar. But if I told you I had two documents that had four words in common, but the documents are only six words long. Now they're pretty similar. So the intersection, the size of the intersection alone is not enough. Perhaps it would be best understood if I, we took the size of the intersection and then somehow standardized it, you know, sort of normalized it according to the sizes of the sets. And one way to do that would be to take the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union, all right, which is a well-known way of measuring the, of, of uh, thinking of the inter uh, similarity between two sets called the Jacquard coefficient. And so the Jacquard coefficient is a way of representing the similarity between set A and set B by saying that the similarity is the size of the intersection divided by the size of the union. Okay, is this a good measure? I mean, does it do the things we would want it to do? Well, first of all, what would happen to the Jacquard coefficient if the sets had no intersection? You know, what if A and B were completely disjoint, like in this picture? Right? Here's A and here's B, and they're not overlapping at all. In other words, there's nothing in the intersection. Well, then this uh, formula for the Jacquard coefficient will have zero up here in the numerator. Therefore, it'll be equal to zero. So that's nice. When the sets are completely disjoint, the Jacquard coefficient is zero. We can say Jacquard coefficient, we can also say Jacquard similarity. So I'll probably switch back and forth between saying those two things. Okay, so if they're disjoint, the Jacquard coefficient is zero. Let's say they are right on top of each other. So A and B are exactly the same. They're identical sets. In other words, everything is in the intersection. Well, that means everything that's in the intersection is also in the union. And so these are just the same two sets. A intersect B and A union B are identical sets. So this ratio is going to be 1. Okay, so if they're identical, the Jacquard coefficient is 1. And if they're somewhere in between, so in other words, if there's some stuff uh, in the intersection, but there's also some stuff in one set but not in the other, so there's some stuff in the symmetric difference, is what we call that. So if there's some stuff in the intersection and some stuff in the symmetric difference, then the Jacquard coefficient is going to be between 0 and 1. Right? The numerator is not going to be 0 because, like we said, there is some stuff in the intersection. So the numerator is not 0. But the numerator is going to be less than the denominator because there's some stuff in the symmetric difference. Right? So there's some stuff that's being counted in the denominator that's not being counted in the numerator. So the Jacquard coefficient is, in at least in at least this sense, is behaving the way we would want. If the sets are disjoint, it's zero. If the sets are identical, it's one. If the sets have a higher degree of overlap, if they have more stuff in the intersection relative to the union, then they have a higher Jacquard coefficient. Okay? 
All right, so there's our measure of similarity, the Jacquard coefficient, written in terms of, uh, pretty sim it's a pretty simple formula, right? It's written in terms of the cardinality of the intersection divided by the cardinality of the union. It's instructive, though, to just take this and write it a few different ways. Um, just because, ultimately, we're going to be concerned with estimating this thing. And if we want to estimate this thing, it's not always a sure thing that we're going to be able to get at the cardinality of the intersection and the cardinality of the union. Maybe we can get one or the other of these, but it's hard to get the other. In which case, it'll be useful for us to think of, well, what are some different equivalent ways of representing the Jacquard coefficient? So one of them would be like this, okay? So here I've taken, the numerator has not changed, right? So the numerator is exactly the same. All I've done is I've rewritten the denominator. At, instead of writing the size of the union of A and B, I wrote it as the size of the intersection plus the size of the symmetric difference. And clearly those two things add to the size of the union. In other words, the, am the amount of stuff in the intersection in the middle part of the Venn diagram plus the amount of stuff in the union but not in the intersection equals the size of the union. Okay, so this, this, and the, this are the same. And one of the ways you might, one of the reasons you might want to write it this way, like I say here, is it really helps to isolate what's special about the denominator. The denominator is the place where all the stuff in the symmetric difference gets counted. Apart from that, it's the same stuff in the numerator and the denominator. The stuff that's in the intersection goes in both the numerator and the denominator. The, what goes only in the denominator is the stuff that's in the symmetric difference. So that, that, might, that might be, and just a little reminder, that, blue, that green triangle symbol is the symbol for symmetric difference. It can be uh, written different ways. This is one way to write it. Okay, what's another way to write this? Well, one thing that's interesting about the way we just wrote it is that we got rid of the um, cardinality of the union, right? So the cardinality of the union is not written here because we rewrote it as this sum. There's another way we can write this equation that does away with the cardinality of the union, which is to write it like this. All we did here, again, the numerator's the same. Size of A intersect B is the same. What's different is we've rewritten the union as, and this is just the expression from the previous slide where we did the double counting thing, right? We said that the size of the union is equal to the size of set A plus the size of set B, except then we've double counted the intersection, so we have to subtract off the size of the intersection. All right, I just did that substitution. I substituted this in for this. Okay, so now we have a way of writing the Jacquard coefficient purely in terms of the cardinality of A, the cardinality of B, and the cardinality of their intersection. And remember, the, the double counting principle is a two-way street. We can turn a union into an intersection, we can also turn an intersection into a union. So let's do it the other direction. And that gives us this final way of writing it. Where this time I've left the denominator alone. That denominator is the same as we originally wrote it. But I took the numerator and rewrote it using the double counting principle. So now it's size of A plus size of B minus size of union. Okay, why did we do all this? Well, it's going to turn out, as we'll see later, it's much more of a challenge to try to estimate the size of the intersection of the two sets compared to how hard it is to find the size of the union of two sets. Okay, so the good news is that we've come up with a way of writing the Jacquard coefficient, this way right here, only in terms of the cardinality of A, the cardinality of B, and the cardinality of the union. Okay, so just keep that in mind. All right. Small exercise, all right? Let's say I would like to know the Jacquard coefficient between these two sets, A and B, that we were using at the beginning. What's that gonna be? Well, it's the size of the intersection over the size of the union. So let's just write the intersection in the numerator. What's the intersection? It's just three and four, so size of that. And then the denominator, let's write the union. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, size of that. So what do we get? We get two sevenths. Okay, so just a little exercise. Okay, 
So this Jacquard coefficient is something we'd like to be able to estimate. When we say we want to use ideas like kth minimum value, like sketching, in order to get at the similarity between sets, that means we would like to use those same sorts of, sort of ideas to estimate the Jacquard coefficient between two sets. Okay. Eventually we'll get to be talking about min hash. Okay. And so if you're familiar with min hash already, then you might be familiar with another term, which is resemblance, the resemblance between two documents. Jacquard coefficient is the same thing as resemblance. Okay. They're not, they're not two different ideas. They're the same idea. Okay. So returning to kth minimum value, right? That was all about estimating the cardinality of a set by first finding the kth minimum among hash values of items in the set and then plugging it into an equation and we derived and justified that equation. Now let's take the idea of keeping all k of the kth minimum values, keeping all of those around and think about how do we use all k of them for set A and all k of them for set B to try to figure out the Jacquard coefficient, the similarity between the two sets. Okay, so let's say we have large data sets A and B and we find the eight minimum hashes for all the items in set A. We just take every item in set A, apply a hash function, and then check to see is this hash value among the eight smallest I've seen so far. If so, update. If not, keep going do it again and again and again and again. Same thing for set B. And so at the end of the day, for set e A, we will have A8. For set A, we will have eight hash values. Small hash values, right? Because they were the minimal eight. So let's say it's these. These are the eight hash values, the eight minimal hash values for set A. And of course, same thing for set B. Okay. You can tell just by looking at these two sets pictured here, that we've, we've learned something about the size of the intersection and about the size of the union and about the size of the symmetric difference. Because, for example, we see that there's some values that are shared between the two um, sets of eight minimal hash values. Three is shared, seven is shared, uh, 11 is shared, 17 is shared, 23 is shared. So we see some sharing. This is indicative of items that are in the intersection. But we also see some items that are not shared. 2 is not shared, 6 is not shared. These are indicative of items that are in the symmetric difference. Okay, so this is good news. It means that we seem to be getting at being able to use these hash values to estimate the card similarity. Okay, so let's just visualize this a different way. So we were thinking of the hash function as giving us, you know, values on this real interval from 0 up to 1. Let's now think again of a sort of um, slot-based view of what's coming out of the hash function. Think of the hash function as putting things into slots. So here are some of the slots corresponding to the smallest possible hash values. All right? And let's just populate it. Let's just fill it in with the numbers from set A and set B. So I've got a row here for set A. So let me just highlight where all the items in my... Uh, in my table here fall, 0, 1, 2, 3, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 15, 17, let's see, 22 would be here, 23 would be here, all right? So there, there's where all the eight minimum hash values from set A fall. And let's do the same with set B, 2 here. 3, 6, 7, 9, 11, 17, 23. Okay. So now we've got a way of visualizing on something like a number line where the minimal 8 hash values fall for set A and for set B. Okay. So given that, Given what we've drawn in here on this diagram, my question is, can we allocate these hash values to a Venn diagram? Like figure out which are the ones that correspond to items in the intersection versus items that are in A but not B versus items that are in B but not A. 
And we can assume for, assume for the purpose of this discussion that there's no collisions. In other words, each of these hash values came from a distinct item in the input, right? So we're going to draw conclusions about um, similarity between the input data sets. Okay. Well, let's draw a hat, let's draw a Venn diagram and let's just think about where these things go. So, as we uh, populate this Venn diagram, let's first of all sort of we're going to move left to right. So we're going to start with the lower hash values, and one thing we're going to do is we're going to just ignore the values in the range of the hash function where there are no items from either set that have that hash value, right? Those basically speak to items that are in neither A nor B, right? So like 0 and 1 are out here. They're in neither A nor B. Okay? The interesting ones, are obviously, are going to be the ones that have a value from either A or B in them or both. Right? So for example, 2 is in B, but it's not in A. So we would put 2 here. In the symmetric difference, right, we're not putting it in the intersection because there's no 2 from set A. We're putting it in the symmetric difference where it's in B but not A. Here, 3. Now, that's something that's in both A and B. So we would put that right here in the intersection, right, and so on. So let's see, 4 and 5 are also out here. They're not in either set. But here's, let's just do 6, 7, 8, 9. So 6 and 9 are in B but not A. 7 is in both. 8 is in A but not B. So we put 8 here. All right, and so on. 10 is out here. 11 is in here. I'm going to skip now the ones that are in neither A nor B, just because there's too many of them. And I'll just say, okay, so 15 is in A but not B. 17 is in the intersection. 22 is in A but not B. 23 is in the intersection. Okay, so we can allocate them to places in the Venn diagram. Here we go. All right, so this is good news because obviously depending on where these things fall in the Venn diagram, we can update our notion, our estimate of what the Jacquard coefficient is. Okay, so it seems like we have enough information in order to do it. So now let's think a bit more formally about what is the approach we're actually going to take in order to do this. Okay, and we're specifically going to be thinking in terms of um, the union and the intersection, right? The Jacquard similarity is the size of the intersection over the size of the union. So let's start by doing something that tells us about the union, which is we're going to take our two sketches, our two sets of eight minimal hash values for A, eight minimal hash values for B, and we're just going to come up with a new, a new table here, which corresponds to what are, the, what are the hash values that we would get if we asked for the eight minimal hash values from the union of A and B. Now we don't, that's not one of our input sets, right? Our input sets are A and B. So now we're asking a question about A union B. But we can answer that question purely by looking at the two sets of hash values that we have, right? So for example, we know that two is going to be the minimal hash value for the set A union B, right? We can tell because it's the minimal among the two, uh, among the two uh, sets of eight for A and B, right? So we know that this is going to have two. It's going to have three. It's going to have six, right? Six. It's going to have seven. It's going to have eight, nine, eleven, and what? Fifteen. In other words, all I did was I took these numbers over here, and I just took the eight minimal hash values from among those. And I know that those eight minimal hash values are also the eight minimal hash values we would have found if we'd asked for the eight minimal hash values over the union of A and B. Okay, here they are. And here they're color-coded according to whether they were from B only, right, 2, 6, and 9, or from A only, 8 and 15, or from both, 3, 7, and 11. Okay, so that union, uh, that union sketch, I'll call this the union sketch. I'll call each of these sketches. So that's the sketch for A. That's the sketch for B. And I'll call this the union sketch. Okay. So the items in the union sketch came kind of like from 
taking the values down here and squashing them, sort of like if it was in either A or B, then it got into this sketch, right? So 2 having been in B made it in, 3 having been in both made it in, and so on, right? And we ended up taking 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Did I count that right? 8. There we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. The 8 lowest hash values that were in either the sketch for A or the sketch for B. So the point of all this is that the hash values that end up in the union sketch are essentially a random sample of the, val of the hash values in the union of the two sets. Right? This is true for any of the sketches. All the hash function is doing is it's taking the input data and putting it in a, essentially in a random order. It's giving it a random permutation. So that when the items go through the hash functions, they end up in an arbitrary spot. So therefore, if we take the minimum or the minimum hash value or the minimum k hash values, that's essentially just a random sample of items from the input. All right? So any sketch can be thought of as a random sample of items from the set. The union sketch is special because this is a random sample of items from the union. And remember, the size of the union is the denominator of the Jacquard coefficient. So my point here is that if we have essentially what we have here is eight random samples from the union of A and B, and we know which of those samples are in both A and B, right? Three out of the eight were in both A and B, then this gives us a simple, direct way of estimating the Jacquard coefficient. It's nothing but the fraction of items that are in the union sketch that were in both of the original sets. 3 over 8 in this case, right? So the fraction that are also in the intersection is our estimate for the Jacquard coefficient. Right? The, denom the denominator is 8 because that's how many samples we got from the union of uh, A and B. And the numerator is 3 because that's how many of those samples were in both A and B, right? Which we knew because we, were, we independently also sketched A and B separately. Okay. So that's the idea. It's like this whole procedure is just a matter of taking random samples from the union, but knowing enough about sets A and B so that we know which of those are in the intersection as well. And it's not exactly the Jacquard coefficient, right? I've got a wavy equal sign here because we didn't do this for the whole set A and the whole set B and the whole set A union B. We just did it for the K, a sample of K items from the union, right? So. That's why it's an estimate, that's why this is a wavy equal sign, and the larger k gets, you know, the more items end up in our union sketch, the closer and closer we're getting to just directly calculating the Jacquard coefficient over the full sets. Okay? So there we go. So it's really just a simple matter of building the union sketch on the way to building the union sketch, keeping track of which of those items are in both sets, and the our estimate for the Jacquard coefficient is nothing but the fraction of items in the union sketch that are in the intersection. This is what I'll call the direct way of estimating the uh, Jacquard coefficient. Is there also an indirect way? Right, so we have this, this is our sort of diagram showing us what we did for the direct way. We built the union sketch and then those three were in the intersection, so 3 over 8. Um, 3 over 8. So is there an indirect way? Perhaps by way of one of those equations that we wrote for the union intersection, for the um, Jacquard coefficient, which was to take A plus B minus size of union over size of union. Because after all, looking at what we've done so far, we've built a sketch for A, a sketch for B, and a sketch for A union B. It seems like we are able now to independently estimate all three of these things. We can estimate the size of A, using the hat problem, right, using our 1 over n, 1 over n plus 1 style uh, estimates, right, we can estimate the size of A, we can estimate the size of B, we can estimate the size of A union B. So we actually have another way of estimating the similarity, the Jacquard coefficient. Not this direct way of building the union sketch and then asking what fraction are in the intersection, but a more indirect way. So let's just see what that would look like. Um, just as an aside, because, you know, it's a good reuse of what we learned in the cardinality section. Um, so the indirect way, we're trying to get at um, 
estimates for the cardinality of all, of all three of these, and we could just use kth minimum value, because after all, we've got the eight minimal hash values for A and for B and for A union B. So we can just take the eighth minimum value from all three, and in each case, use that to estimate the cardinality of that set, and then form the uh, ratio. Okay, so I won't go through all the steps, but the calculation looks like this, right? I'm just plugging in 23 and 23, and I'm plugging in 15, and I'm using the um, discrete version of the kth minimum value where I put the number of possible, I'm just pretending that the hash function, the range of the hash function only goes up to 8,000, just for the purpose of this calculation. And I get a number at the end, which is another way of estimating the Jacquard coefficient, kind of building more on what we learned in the previous um, lecture. All right. By far the more common way is the, is the first way I mentioned, using the union sketch, treating the items in the union sketch as being random samples from the union, and therefore asking what fraction of them are also in the intersection. Something to note, computationally speaking, everything we've done here is pretty easy. All right. We just have used one hash function, right? We're using the kind of bottom K. In fact, that's the terminology used in the literature. We're using the bottom K, the kth minimum hash values from a single hash function. We are not doing K separate hash functions, although that would be another way to do it. And that is how the min hash idea is often explained in the literature. Um, uh, so applying the hash function is not a whole lot of work, right? It's just a little bit of work for each item coming in. Keeping track of what are the minimal k hash values so far is also not that much work, right? You can imagine doing this with the help of like a heap or a queue or a sorted list or something like that. Actually determining what's the kth minimum value, well, that's trivial. You know, if you have the k minimal values, you just take the, you just take the biggest one and that's the kth minimum value. Um, you know, getting the union sketch is really just a matter of taking the two independent sketches of A and B and merging them, right? Merging them up to eight values, merging them up to K values. And then calculating the Jacquard is just something you can do during the process of that merge, since as you're merging, you know which of the values are coming from both A and B and which are the ones coming from either A or B, but not both. So none of the computation here is very complex. It's all quite easy makes this a very practical approach. All of this corresponds to the min hash idea first proposed in the 1990s as a way of summarizing web pages to make it easier to search the World Wide Web. So this was something that was used, for example, by the, the uh, AltaVista web search engine back in the 90s. And it's ex incredibly common today as well. Min hash is an extremely widely used approach. Right? So if we have a sketch for A and a sketch for B, could we have combined these to get a sketch for the intersection? And if so, wouldn't that also have been a good way of getting at the Jacquard coefficient or getting at one of those components for estimating the Jacquard coefficient? And here the answer is no, not necessarily, right? Because unlike with the union sketch, we probably don't actually have enough information in the sketches for A and B to fully populate the intersection sketch, right? We're just not going to have enough, uh, right? Because what would happen in this particular case? Well, we would see that three is in both. So three would be the smallest value going into our intersection sketch. And then the next highest would be 11. I'm sorry, seven. And then the next highest would be 11. The next highest would be 17. The next highest would be 23. And then we've run out of we've run out of items in the individual sketches for A and B. We don't know how to populate the rest of the intersection sketch, right? We've got these sort of three question marks here, right? And the degree to which it's difficult for us to populate this intersection sketch depends on how large the intersection is, right? It depends on essentially how high the Jacquard coefficient is. If we just took these two sets and changed the values ever so slightly, we just shifted them around a bit, right? We could find ourselves in a situation where we, we only have two items th that we can place into the intersection sketch, right? Because there just aren't very many items among the bottom eight that are in the intersection, right? So this is not as effective as using the union sketch and asking what fraction of items in the union sketch are also in the intersection. We just don't have enough information to create a, a full uh, intersection sketch, except in the special case where the uh, bottom K happen to be identical between the two sets. Okay, 
So just like we said with kth minimum value, we have different ways that we can come up with the sketches, right? We can come up with the sketch the way we've been describing, which is we apply one hash function to all the input items, and we take the k minimal hash values from all the items. That corresponds to this middle one, bottom k, and that was what was proposed in the original minhash work from the mid-90s by, by Andre Broder. Um, another way um, that we could do it, just like we said with kth minimum value, is we could use k different hash functions and just take the minimal value from each of the k hash functions. Um, and this is indeed sometimes the way that the approach is explained in the literature. But it's not so efficient because, of course, for each input item, we now have to run k hash functions on it instead of just one hash function. Um, and then there's this final approach, which is that we can take the domain of the hash function and divide it up into k partitions. And then we can ask, what's the minimal hash value within each of those partitions? And then we use those as the items that we put into our sketch. That's just another way of accomplishing the same thing we were accomplishing here, still by only using one hash function. And this is sometimes called one permutation min hash or one permutation hashing. One last quick point about min hash, which, uh, which is we haven't talked about what property we need the hash function to have. You know, when we were talking about hash tables and we were proving things about the um, uh, query time, the expected query time for hash tables, we used two universality, or we used universe, universal hash functions as the property that we said was the one we needed. In this case, the hash functions are serving a slightly different purpose, right? They are mixing the order of the input items. So the property that we need is kind of the degree to which they do a good job of mixing so that the different bottom k sketches that we get are essentially entirely new bottom k sketches, right? There's not something redundant or non-independent with a previous bottom k sketch. Um, this is a different property. It's sometimes called minwise independence as opposed to something like pairwise independence or something like that. And minwise independence is just a separate idea. If you want, if you want an idea of uh, the work that's been done in this area, here's an example of a paper. Um, and it describes the difference between min, minwise uh, independence versus the kind of pairwise independence that characterizes universal hash functions.